Thank, thank you very much, Peter. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm a member of the historical group, the RSC's historical group and the chemical information and computer applications group committees. Uh, and I'm also in the North Staffordshire local section as well. So obviously I'm a bit of a, a, a committee geek. Um, my background is obviously I have a chemistry degree and um, I then went on to start off working in, in uh, chemistry publications uh, for Derwent Information and then the uh, International Union of Crystallography, followed by um, qualifying as a librarian and going on to work at UMIST in the uh, library, in the chemistry department primarily. Um, after that, I uh, moved to um, to be employed fully by the chemistry department, actually, where I was teaching chem informatics and chemi chemical information skills. And following that, I went to GlaxoSmithKline in uh, Philadelphia and stayed there until I took um, early retirement in tw oh, 2014 or thereabouts. So now I'm a full time volunteer almost at uh, Nantwich Museum and also working for the, and also um, for the Royal Society of Chemistry as well as a volunteer, of course, on the various committees. So that's my background. So, um, uh, Peter, I don't know if you're ready now to take over. Yes, um, we've now got 63 people and um, uh, uh, Helen, could you now begin with your talk on chemical information, pioneering people and publication? Helen, over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. And hopefully everyone can see my screen okay. So, okay, so first of all, just a few words about the scope of the talk today, because it's a big subject, a very, very, very big subject, and I can't possibly compress it all into 45 minutes or an hour. I guess an hour is my absolute maximum. So just to give you uh, a few clues about the scope, I'm going to be focusing on what I refer to as the primary literature. And this is, this is um, primarily journals and other sources of information where original work is reported and this is kind of a more is a modern definition if you like so journals would fall into that category of uh, modern journals will fall into the category of primary information and i'm also going to talk about secondary information so those th are things like abstract abstracts which are tools for finding the information in the primary literature now I should say that I'm definitely not going to be talking about textbooks. So if you if you're interested in textbooks and other other books um, on chemistry, I'm afraid apart from a few hand, some handbooks I'm going to mention, uh, I'm afraid uh, this talk probably isn't for you. But if you if you have some interest in the history of journals, abstracts, and how to find information in the past, then then hopefully it'll be something of interest here. Now the people that I'm featuring are deceased. I decided to take this approach uh, rather than um, go for all um, heroes and pioneers and so on of the chemical of the chemical information world because I thought I might accidentally leave somebody out who is very important. If they alive, if I left a live person out, they would get quite upset, I should think. So, uh, therefore, I'm focusing on the deceased people. Now, the publications, having said that, can be dead or alive. So it'll be some publications that are no longer existing, as well as those that you can still get your hands on, albeit probably mainly in digital format these days rather than in print format. It does, of course, include some of my personal favourites. I've mentioned my, my sort of career history a little bit, so there will be some examples from that, um, that history as we work through this. And maybe even for some people, there might be a bit of a trip down memory lane because a lot of uh, the things I'm going to cover have been around, have, you know, have been around until fairly recent times. And there will be a few that are still around, of course, as well. So uh, first of all, I thought it would be a good idea to just come up with a bit of a definition of what the history of chemical information is all about. So the history of chemical information is closely tied to the, to the development of chemistry as a scientific discipline and the need for systematic organisation and dis dissemination of chemical knowledge. Well, I think that sounds pretty good, a pretty reasonable sort of uh, definition. Now, I didn't make this up. It's in quote marks for a reason, and that's because I'm quoting it from somewhere else. It's not from any learned publication or book on chemical information. In fact, it's from ChatGPT, the uh, uh, artificial intelligence application, which uh, you can put queries into and it will come up with uh, what it thinks is the, is the best answer. And uh, so this came directly from ChatGPT. Now it also uh, it also um, gave me a lot more information as well, but this was the sort of high level summary that uh, ChatGPT came along with. 
Now, I did also test it out with a couple of others just to see if they were consistent. So I had a go at Google Bard and uh, also Microsoft Bing, and they came up with things that were very similar. So I was I was I was pretty impressed by that anyway. And of course, ChatGPT has been in the news a lot just in the last few days, although I did pose this question to it uh, a couple of months ago now. OK, so having started with a modern, let's go back to uh, the, the olden days, the very, very olden days and the development of journals. So um, until the late 18th century, the sciences were not differentiated and the, the, the history of chemical information sort of mirrors the, the history of chemistry, I suppose, in a way that the, the chemical information had to keep track of what was going on or the chemi chemical information sources and the people who produced the chemical information sources had to be very mindful of what was going on in the chemistry world itself, because that was going to be the source of the information that was going to make its way into, into the publications. So until the late 18th century or thereabouts, uh, the sciences were not differentiated. So journals, for instance, would be covering, generally would be covering the whole of science rather than there being specific chemistry journals. Journals um, that published science were very diverse in their coverage as a result of that. And chemistry, um, by definition, I suppose, having told you what I've already told you, uh, chemistry was originally included journals in journals which had a broad scope. So, for example, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society was definitely a pioneering journal because it was the first uh, British journal that really, um, that really published a lot of science. Now, behind, by the end of the 18th century, there were around about 100 scientific journals, just to give you a feel for how big the, uh, the landscape was, the publishing landscape. So a little bit more about um, philosophical transactions. It was the world's longest running, which is the, it is the world's longest running journal. It was founded in 1665 and it predated journals covering purely chemistry for over a century, by over a century. Now, it wasn't the first, having said that, uh, the very, very first uh, journal uh, that, that was really focusing on science was a French journal called Journal des Savants. And this was published, first published on the 5th of January, uh, 1665, but it ceased publication in 1792. So it, it didn't do too badly. It uh, had quite, it had quite a, long, um, a long period in publication, but, um, uh, Philosophical Transactions was just a couple of months later, so it started publication on the 7th of March 1665, and it's still published today, as I've already mentioned. Now, over, the over time, there have obviously, of course, been developments in subject coverage of Philosophical Transactions, and um, the type of content included as well. So, for example, in the early days, Letters and notifications of new books tended to dominate the contents rather than original research, as we would refer to it today. And this continued until the late 19th century. Uh, and at th that time, things started to get a bit more organized. Structured papers that were published became more structured and they were written more in impersonal language rather than the first person and, uh, and, and, um, and more subjective in a way almost when people talked about their experiences. The Philosophical Transactions was published by the Royal Society, and in 1753 it was adopted as the Royal Society's official publication, and it did include quite a lot of work by some famous chemists or natural philosophers, as they would be referred to uh, back in the day. So, for example, Robert Boyle, who was uh, a mentor to Henry Oldenburg, who was the first editor of Philosophical Transactions, he was a, a frequent com um, contributor to the journal. So a little bit more about um, Henry, Henry Oldenburg. Uh, he was the first editor and also the secretary to first editor of Philosophical Transactions and the secretary to the Royal Society. And he was ideally positioned uh, really in his role as the, uh, as the secretary of the society because he had responsibility for record keeping and correspondence. So no one was better informed than him about the activity and the activity in the organization of natural philosophy in England at the time. It is, I think, um, since I've been a, a volunteer at Nantwich Museum, I've got far more interested in just not, I've always been interested in my PhDs in the history of science um, um, and the history of scientific publishing really. But um, since I've become uh, involved with 
uh, volunteering for Nantwich Museum, I become much more interested in sort of general history as well. And I think it's really quite interesting to put this time period into the context and all the things that were going on around. So for example, Oldenburg had to reckon with the disruptions caused by the second and third Anglo-Dutch wars, which took place in 1665 to 1667, and also from 1672 to 74. And this would have severely uh, impacted the communications with the continent. And Philosophical Transactions did publish some, some information from, uh, the, from Europe, from, from uh, continental Europe, as well as, as from England and Britain, of course. But um, there would have been a period where communication uh, was, was more difficult than it should have been. And then you've got things like the plague coming along. So, for example, in the summer of 1665, uh, the plague drove most of the senior fellows out of the, of the Royal Society fellows out of the town. Although Oldenburg himself did decide to stay, while uh, so, so he was he was still there in control of the philosophical transactions, even when everybody else was fleeing the capital. And then you have the Great Fire of, of uh, London that happened in September 1666, and that forced the society out of its home in Gresham College, Gresham College into temporary quarters. And then he also had personal um, things to contend with, bereavement when his first wife died. Uh, and he was even imprisoned in the Tower of London in the summer of 1667 on suspicion of espionage during the Anglo-Dutch War, although I do believe that he uh, he um, was, was cleared of that charge. And he was also uh, in relative poverty until his second marriage in 1668. So quite a lot going on in a relatively short period of time for Henry Oldenburg and a lot of challenges that we would probably wouldn't even think about very much today. Um, I, as one of the things I've done as uh, as being a member of the historical the RSE's historical group is that I did I, I have written a book review, and I was privileged to have the opportunity to write a review of the book that's cited at the bottom of this slide, and that's where I gathered quite a lot of information from. And I do recommend it if you're interested in this kind of topic. It's something that's very good, and it is available in digital form as well as print. I'm not sure um, how much the digital one costs uh, now, unfortunately, but um, anyway, that's that's something I do recommend. So I thought, let's have a look back at the sorts of things that were actually published in uh, Philosophical Transactions back in the early days. So what better place to start than volume one in 1665? And this is a selection of the articles. Now, we may chuckle a little bit when we look at these titles, but they do show the diversity of topics covered by the journal and what was achievable at the time. Um, of course, it was only another another thing. It was only about 10 years after the English Civil War, which we think of, of course, as being a rather barbaric and disruptive to normal life. But there was some quite sophisticated work going on. Now, I'm particularly uh, I was particularly intrigued by this one, the third one down that says an account of a very odd, monstrous calf. And this was a contribution from uh, Robert Boyle. Uh, and um, we also have one down at the bottom from Robert Hook, an account of Mr. Hook's micrography, micrographia, or the physiological descriptions of minute bodies by, made by magnifying glasses. And that was a book review. Um, I'm not sure who wrote the book review, but anyway, it was a book review. And the uh, error in uh, Robert Hook's uh, spelling, that is directly a quote, it's not my typo, although I can do those sometimes, but this was not, um, not a typo. Incidentally, I have uh, put a few QR codes dotted around in this presentation. So if you're interested in following up on some of the references, uh, if you get your phone out, you might be able to do that um, by, uh, by homing in on what you can see on the screen in the way of those QR codes. Now, another uh, pet project of mine in recent years has been to research the life and achievements of Joseph Priestley. In fact, I did a talk on Priestley uh, oh, a year or so ago, probably more than that, for the historical group. But Priestley uh, lived in what is now my hometown of Nantwich from 1758 to 61. He doesn't have a very high profile in Nantwich, and I'm desperately trying to improve this because uh, he, he, did have, he did do some quite good things, even though he was still a young man when he was living in, uh, in Nantwich, and it was before he discovered oxygen. But Priestley published in the Philosophical Transactions, and this is just one example of the page that you can see here, albeit a very significant one. And this paper was read to the Royal Society in 1772. Looks like it was in four sections on the 5th of March, the 12th, the 19th and the 26th. 
and it predated his six volume book on experiments and observations on different kinds of air, but it does have the same title. So it, it's a, it, it is a precedent to that, I suppose. And the big book, the six volume book was published between 1774 and 86. Now Priestley was a fellow of the Royal Society, but uh, this he, he he was awarded that in seventeen in seventeen six seventeen sixty six. But that was for his work on on uh, electricity, not on um, on uh, on different kinds of air. So philosophical transactions was one of a number of of, of journals, including the Journal de Savants, of course, that published a range of different uh, branches of the. Uh, um, natural philosophy and science as we would know it today. Uh, the very first chemistry journal was pu was published in 1778. And you can see uh, the second bullet on the page on the slide here. The first in 1778, Krell's chemistry journal, and then it has a very long name. And that would be an embarrassment uh, if I try to pronounce the German because German isn't really my forte. But in English, it translates, translates as Krell's Chemical Journal for the Friends of Natural Science, but its abbreviated still further to Krell's Annalen. Now, this started in 1778 and it ceased publication in 1803, so it wasn't particularly uh, long lived, but nevertheless, it was still quite a pioneering uh, piece of work because it was the very first. Now, you'll note that the script, this is the front page of the very first volume, uh, of Krell's journal, and you'll be able to see that it's all in the uh, old German script, of course, which makes it particularly difficult to uh, to translate and interpret, but um, it, it can be done. Uh, anyway, Krell, he has a, a name almost as long as the title of his journal here, Lorenz Florenz Friedrich von Krell. He was uh, a very well qualified, highly educated person, and uh, he was the professor of theoretical medicine and materia medica at the University of Helmstadt in Germany. So here we have the first article in the first issue of Krell's journal. And um, I, did, I did have a go at translating this and I think it comes out with the title, correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone has anything, any corrections or, 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 or uh, other comments, please do put them in the chat. And incidentally, as I'm working through all this, I meant to say it at the beginning, if you have, if there's anything here that sparks off particular memories, I'd be very interested to know what those are. If you feel like putting those in the chat as well as any questions, um, that would be, that would be quite nice if someone has any memories. Obviously, all of these publications are far too old for anyone who's attending today to, to have been around at the time, but there may be some later on that, uh, that you may be familiar with. So anyway, this publication, I did want to check that there really was some chemistry in it, which is why I had a good look at it, concerned with the preparation of phosphorus from human bones. And um, that's, those seem to be the key words there that, uh, that, uh, that uh, confirmed to me that what this uh, publication was about, what this article was about. One thing I did not uh, work out what was going on was the picture at the top of the page there. If anyone has any ideas about what's going on there, I would also be very interested to know. Um, I have literally no idea. So let's have a look now at the journal, journal publishing landscape in general and how things were growing and developing with time. So uh, there were over 70 chemistry journals that were being published prior to 1841. Now 1841 is a significant date as I'll come on to explain in a moment. But um, in that time, at that time, there were 38 in Germany, which proves that um, German was a very dominant language, as probably most of us know, certainly in that time period. Britain, France and Italy had eight each. Holland had five, Belgium three, Sweden and Russia had one each. Now, by the mid 19th century, the learned societies started to publish journal journals and the foundation of the Chemical Society in London was actually in 1841 and this set a precedent and that was followed by many other European countries and the US of A of course. Now the Chemical Society is the first in the list and I believe the Memoirs of the Chemical Society was the first chemistry journal that was published by a learned society. Now all of these publications probably qualify as pioneering publications uh, simply because they are representative of the countries uh, from which they are in, originated. 
Acta Chemica Scandinavica, by the way, that was a joint publication by the Chemical Societies of Sweden, Denmark and Finland, oh, and Norway as well, and that ceased publication in 1999. Uh, the Australian Journal of Chemistry, uh, I'm always a little bit surprised when I notice that it only started publication in 1952. And for whatever reason, I think I always think it probably uh, I would have expected to have, it would to have been a little bit sooner than that, but 1952 for the Australian Journal of Chemistry. Now I'm going to have a little diversion. We're going to go off to um, have a look at the Royal Society of Chemistry journals. And starting on the left hand side of the slide here, we've got three of the, the title, the, the changes in the titles of the Chemical Society journals is quite significant. Um, it was quite, was quite complicated actually. And there were several changes and they're all a bit confusing over the first few years of, the exi of its existence. But eventually uh, the Journal of the Chemical Society was um, was launched, and uh, so that one predominated. That was the title that that was uh, maintained for a very long time. Now, by the time I became uh, the chemistry librarian at uh, UMIST, uh, the titles that you see Faraday transactions, Dalton transactions, and Perkin transactions too. In that case, they were what I recall from my days in the library. And there were a few others as well, like um, chemical communications, which was one that I was very familiar with at the time. And then over on the right hand side, we've got a few examples of the RSE's current range of journals. And there is a vast number of them now. We've gone from just one in 1841 to 54 in 1923. And these are just a, not quite a random selection. I, let, I, I did include um, Chemical Society Reviews because that's another one I do remember back in the day. And so that's still going strong with a nice new uh, flashy looking cover uh, on the right hand side. So now let's have a think about um, the, uh, the matter of peer review and, uh, and also objectivity of, uh, of the uh, publications. And um, let me see, I'm just uh, lost my place in my notes a little bit. I think I did juggle these slides around a bit just before I started. And I think my notes have come out um, a little bit out of order here. But uh, anyway, um, the rigor and objectivity peer review originated in the mid 19th century. And at that time it was, uh, it was single blind peer review. So at the time, going back to when um, Henry Oldenburg was the editor of Philosophical Transactions, that uh, there was no peer review to speak of at that time. But by the time we got to the end of the 19th century, more structured papers were being written in internal, in, in, um, in personal language, and these became predominant. And also the uh, production technologies were improving as well in, uh, in the way uh, publications were, were printed and uh, um, bound and, and, and resources were available. But this kind of marks the beginning of the literature explosion, I think. Um, we all know, as we all know, the number and size of journals and other publications was increasing. The amount of chemistry that was going on was increasing. But at what time did it become unmanageable? And what were the solutions to this problem? Because finding information was becoming uh, increasingly difficult for the chemists who were practicing in the laboratory. Now, at this point, I'm going to just uh, refer to a slide, which um, I have used in a presentation. I think I probably used it in a talk I did about um, chemical structures a few years ago for this group, for the Royal Society of Chemistry's historical group. But this slide is by uh, Guillermo Restrepo and his colleagues at the Mas Max Planck Institute. And it was pre presented during a conference in 2021. It was an online conference called Computational Approaches to the History of Chemistry, which was a very um, inspiring um, uh, conference actually, especially as it was right at the beginning of the, um, well, no, it wasn't right at the beginning of the pandemic, but it was a time when we were all, I was very pleased to be able to dial into it because there was no way I was ever going to be able to go there in person um, to attend, but uh, certainly being able to dial in, it was very interesting. Now, this um, slide I'm showing is talking about compounds rather than publications. And I will be flipping back and forth a little bit between compounds and publications and the numbers that appear. Uh, but obviously there's a relationship between the two, but they're not quite apples and apples when we're doing these comparisons. But this chart shows that the heyday for metal compounds was at the beginning of, up to the, was in the period up to the 1860s. Though even then, carbon and hydrogen were present in about half the substances reported. 
From 1860 to 1980, organic compounds took over, reaching 90% of the number of compounds that were, were new compounds that were being produced uh, by the end of that period. And then after 1980, organometallics were becoming more prevalent, prevalent again, or metal compounds uh, were becoming more prevalent. So I quite like this chart. And if you click on that, if you if you do access that uh, QR code, you'll be able to see, or it takes you to the CCAG newsletter actually, where you would be able to, you'll be able to find um, the full report of that, uh, that work that uh, Restrepo and colleagues did at Max Planck Institute. So the secondary literature, coming back to, um, to, to, to the, 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 the articles and the publications really now, rather than the compounds, secondary literature becomes necessary in any subject when the primary literature, whether it be journals, patents, or whichever, whichever kind of primary literature it is, becomes unmanageable. And the aims of secondary literature are to index and organize the primary literature to make it easier for people to find the primary references that will help them with their research because it was getting exceedingly complicated without the presence of secondary literature. So I'm now gonna talk about some secondary sources of information, dead, both dead and alive. And um, the ones that I've pictured on the right, Bulletin Signalétique, which is the French a secondary source of information for chemistry. They're split into various different sections, I think, but this is the chemistry the cover of the chemistry one. And then we have the Russian one down there as well, Referativni Zonal Chimia. Again, forgive my pronunciation, but um, those two I've pictured here because I'm not actually going to talk about them in any detail in the course of the rest of the remainder of the talk. But um, I don't know if, uh, I think uh, the, the Russian one does have a database associated with it now. The Bulletin Signalétique, I wasn't able to find anything out about whether there is a database that covers that journal or whether it exists in any form at all. So again, if anyone has any, any knowledge of that, I would be very uh, interested to know. Now, some of the others um, are, are, I'm gonna to refer to later on. Some of them only live on now in digital form, of course. So I count them as being alive if they're still there in electronic form. So we'll talk a little bit about um, Gamelin. He's uh, one of the earliest ones that I want to mention, but Gamelin, um, he didn't really do abstracts. It was a it was a handbook. People may be familiar with Gamelin's handbook, and it, the difference between something like chemical abstracts, which we're going to come on to a little bit later, uh, compared to Gamelin, is that Gamelin was very much evaluating the information before he published his journal, before he published his handbook or volumes of his handbook. It wasn't just a question of writing short descriptions of individual papers. It was pulling together all the information that was known about specific compounds. And his aim, as you can see there, arrange systematically all the precisely determined facts concerning every element and compound to state these facts succinctly and accurately, and also to give the pertinent references to the literature. So everything was backed up by a reference, of course. Now it started off, Gamelin started off with his handbook. Um, it, it was called the Handbook der Theoretischen Chemie at the first, uh, to begin with, for the first three volumes. And it did cover all branches of chemistry at the time. And uh, later on, it, it became more specialized, moving into the, into the zone of, uh, of uh, inorganic chemistry. And new editions were published periodically as Gamelin, and Gamelin did a lot of the work himself on this as well. So a mammoth task. And this is a picture of um, the first edition. Uh, sorry, no, it isn't a picture of the first, e first edition, this one, no. Um, the first edition contained 48 known elements or ponderable substances as Gamelin referred to them. And by the fifth edition, it was covering only inorganics. Um, 600 volumes by the final print. And people may remember these on the shelves in the libraries where they used to go uh, digging around for information as, um, um, uh, when they were dependent on finding information in books and journals rather than online. Um, now, were there any other key facts I wanted to mention about, um, oh, only the one thing I did want to mention um, about uh, Gamelin as well was that um, for a while it was actually translated into the German version, was translated into English, the fourth edition by Henry Watts, who was, he was the editor of the Chemical Society journals for many years. And he and the English translation of 
the Gamelin Handbook was published by the Cavendish Society between 1849 and 1872. So that was pretty pioneering in itself, I think, at that time. I don't know why the translation ceased. It could well have been because the passing on of, um, of, uh, of Henry, I'm not quite sure. But um, anyway, that's a little bit of history. And then it reverted back to being in, Ger in German only. Now, the fifth edition was concerned only with inorganic compounds. And uh, then later on, of course, there was a different editor once, uh, once Gamelin had passed on. So how was it organized? Well, um, in the interest of time, and I realize that time is passing much more quickly than I anticipated. So I am going to have to accelerate a little bit, but um, basically the way you found compounds was through a system number. So every element had a system number and people would get to know where their favorite um, elements were, I guess. And they'd know, for example, that chlorine had system number six and hydrogen chloride would have been at system number six because uh, everything with a lower system number would be filed within the Gamalian handbook at the place, the position of the, uh, of the element that they had the highest system number. Now, these were not atomic numbers. They were system numbers, which were different. And then we have an example here, uh, the zinc chromate, uh, which has a, it's a little bit more complicated because it's got the three elements in it. And there's a nice article in uh, Mike Sutton's uh, um, article in Chemistry World in May 2017, and in which he describes the Gamalian Handbook as being the first chemistry database. I think even when it was in its printed form, he was regarding it and describing it as a database. Now, this is what it looks like. It looked like on the shelf. So if we were talking about silicon, um, then you can see here on the left hand side, we've got examples of what it looked like in German and then English translations at the top for the more recent volumes. And uh, on the right hand side, a schematic. Um, and all of these came from this uh, little booklet called Synergisms in Chemical Information that was published in 1992. Now we'll move on to organic chemistry and uh, Barstein, Friedrich Conrad Barstein, and uh, he published uh, the Handbook of Organic Chemistry. I do interchange. Sometimes I'll refer to Barstein as the publication, sometimes as the, as the man. Um, but that's kind of habit I got into, I think, when I was working as a librarian. But uh, this started, as I mentioned before, start, first edition was published in 1881, between 1881 and 83, and it contained 15, around about 15,000 compounds in two volumes. And again, like Gamalian, it was focused on the compounds and the reactions rather than the, um, the, the specific articles, although everything would have been referenced, in the, thoroughly referenced with the appropriate uh, uh, papers and so on. So the Gamalian uh, classification scheme, uh, you, you probably got the idea of it really through Gamalian's, uh, the Barstein classification scheme. Again, it's system numbers and uh, similar to uh, to Gamalian in some ways, of course. So once you knew the system number, you were able to trace, you'd be able to trace information about it in more recent volumes as new editions were produced. Now, neither Barstein nor Gamalian were produced on a regular monthly basis or anything like that. They were published when all the information had been gathered for a specific specific time period and it had been reviewed by the editors and, uh, and, and compiled into these substantial tomes like you can see on the left of the screen here that were stored in libraries uh, across the globe. And for example, quinine. Now, again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to, to dwell on this for too long, but this, uh, of course, were to be a heterocyclic compound. So you knew what volume ranges you were likely to find your quinine in. But you've also got information about the part uh, and the pages and so on. And but you would know always that quinine had the system number 3538, which would have enabled you to trace it in the publications on the shelves. By the time I got to working at UMIS Library, I think we had stopped the, um, the stopped the subscription to Bilstein and Gamalin, or maybe maybe we may have still had Bilstein. I'm not sure, but we stopped it fairly soon afterwards for various reasons. But maybe some people, if we're talking of memory lane, might recall there was a, a, a chart that was published by the Barstein um, people. And uh, this is dates from 1978. So this is actually before I was um, at UMIST or in, in any kind of library capacity. So, uh, so I'm not familiar with that chart, but perhaps other people do recall it. And then on the right, this is a picture of the Barstein 
um, building in Frankfurt, the Barstein Institute building. And I really only included it because I do like pictures with cars because they do tend to give you the date uh, that uh, something was actually published. Uh, that, uh, that, that, that the picture was taken, not that it was published, sorry. If you were finding all of this locating of information a little bit complicated, then Bars the Barstein people uh, produced a handy flowchart, which to me looks mighty complicated, but in theory that would have helped you to navigate your way to the compound or the reaction that you were looking for. And there was a, di a dictionary, a Barstein dictionary, that uh, was available uh, that you could actually use to translate if your translate things to into English if your German wasn't particularly good. Now the Barstein and Gamelian handbooks they fell out of use for a number of reasons. The cost they were phenomenally expensive. I can't remember how much now, but they were very very expensive. Uh, if you were an English language speaking person, then there were much easier sources available for you to, uh, to, to refer to. So, for example, chemical abstracts. In Barstein and Gamelin, the information was out of date by the time it was published, and it was very slow to make that transition to English. So 1980 for Barstein, which was the fifth supplement covering 1960 to 1979. And um, so... In 1980, that was the earliest you would get information about things that were published in 1960. So not perfect if you're wanting to keep up to date with the information. Ultimately, the, they were both saved by the Crossfire system, which then later went on to become Reaxis. And I'm very familiar with Crossfire because I used to, or I was, because uh, I used to teach students across the UK and in Scandinavia and Ireland as well um, as part of my role in my latter days at um, uh, working at UMIST. Now, this is another publication um, which I didn't, uh, hadn't come across until very recently. And I, th I have to thank Diana Leach for this. She may be on the call today, I'm not sure, but she mentioned it during a recent phone conversation that we had. And um, this was uh, a publication which started in the second half of the 19th century and uh, really was also very pioneering. Nobody perhaps had thought of doing this before, but the, uh, the, all, the editors uh, went back through the literature, this, this uh, going right back to around about 1800, their ambition was to track periodicals and record papers back to the year 1800 and uh, then produce a bibliographic index so that people could identify papers that way. Now, this is something, as I say, I didn't actually come across uh, until very, very recently. And you can actually get this on archive.org, which is one of my favorite sources for historical information. So uh, this is the paper, this is the cover or the first page from 1869 of the catalog of scientific papers later superseded by the International Catalogue of Scientific Literature. But I do think um, it went out, it, it then ceased in 1921, but I'm sure this must have been because of the arrival and popularity of chemical abstracts, which came along in 1907. Which leads me nicely, I think, into talking about uh, abstracts. As we discovered earlier, before abstracts journals existed, I think um, they often include abstracts of papers published elsewhere amongst the original articles. So certainly the Journal of the Chemical Society was one of those journals that included um, uh, abstracts of papers published elsewhere as well. So they were often the um, origins, these kinds of journals, the Learned Societies journals, were mostly uh, the originators of abstracts journals that appeared at a later date. Now we've all seen these kinds of charts before, I'm sure, the literature explosion and um, the chart I showed from uh, Restrepo and colleagues earlier on, that one uh, also showed how there was an exponential growth in compounds. This is showing the exponential growth in chemical abstracts, so we're talking here about uh, papers rather than compounds. And uh, the doubling, there's a quote on the right hand side, again referring to substances, that uh, shows that chemistry doubles its material output about every 16 years. So it's still going on, this literature explosion is still going on um, to, in a ridiculous way really almost now. And that's from a, a book by uh, Jost and Restrepo from 2022, a fairly new book. This chart shows uh, the provenance of some of the abstracts. I'm gonna talk a little bit about British chemical abstracts shortly. Um, that has its origins in the, the Chemical Society and uh, 
uh, eventually the, the blue the blue arrows are actually the abstracts journals and the date ranges during which they were alive. Um, we've got the German in the middle bit, the, the sort of yellowish coloured section there, and uh, that shows uh, Chemische Zentralblatt as the abstracts journal. And then at the bottom, the only one of those that is still going strong is uh, chemical abstracts, of course, and that goes on now in electronic form. Chemistry Central Blatt. Um, Michael Gordon, in his uh, his fascinating book, actually Scientific Babel, which I read fairly recently, um, that he, he quotes in there. He said, "No chemist has ever read the entire Chemistry Central Blatt, but for well over a century, not a single practicing chemist was able to conduct research without it." Now, Chemistry Central Blatt published abstracts of the world's chemistry's literature, chem world's chemistry literature, but it was in German. It stopped publication in World War II, but its use of the German language is already becoming a bit of a problem by the time of the publication centenary in, um, in 1930. And uh, Michael Gordon's book that uh, cited here explores, explores this language barrier in some, in, in some detail and explains quite clearly why this sort of transition, why, why, how Germany became, German became the dominant language for publishing chemistry and other sciences too, and, um, and how that, that changed and the reasons behind the changes and so on. Eventually this led to the death of Chemistry Central Blatt and uh, it, it ceased publication in 1969. So now finally we're going to have a look at chemical abstracts and I really am in, destined to overrun in this so I'm going to have to go a little bit more quickly. Uh, chemical abstracts probably was and still is the most in important source of chemical information and there's a little bit here about its provenance. It originated uh, with the review of chemical American chemical research and it first started publishing as a chemical as an abstracts journal in 1907 and it was sponsored by the American Chemical Society. And its objective, it reminds me a little bit of the Gamelin's objective, I think, was to abstract the complete world's literature of chemistry. Now, chemical abstracts um, talk a little bit about the, uh, the, uh, the, the background to chemical abstracts here. How did it come into existence? Well, uh, convinced that United States chemists weren't getting the recognition they deserved uh, because most of the, the secondary sources of information had European origins at that time, Arthur A. Noyes, and there's an awful lot of noise in this slide, I have to say, because we've got three noises I'm going to refer to, but Arthur A. Noyes, who lived from 1866 through to 1936, he was at MIT and he started the Review of Chemical Research, which provided abstracts and reviews of papers, uh, to, and, and they began appearing in a publication produced by um, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The third volume of this publication appeared as part of the Journal of the American Chemical Society in 1879, and um, then that went on to become uh, Chemical Abstracts with William A. Noyes, different Noyes. Um, he he became the editor from 1850. Um, he became editor. Uh, he, sorry, he lived from 1857 to 1941, but he became the editor of Chemical Abstracts. But the most, most well-known person involved with Chemical Abstracts was Evan J. Crane, and he was a long-term editor, and uh, he was also a, a prolific writer in the field of chemical information as well. So uh, a very um, well-known person, Evan J. Crane, for chemical information scientists like myself. And this picture on the left is of Crane um, with Austin M. Patterson, one of the other editors and librarian um, um, from 1917 to 1923. Now, working on chemical abstracts, I will just talk a little bit about this. I have a, there's a lovely paper that I referenced down at the bottom here by Janet Scott, and she's writing in Journal of Chemical Education. And she talks about the life of an associate editor of chemical abstracts back in the 1930s. So you can see from the picture on the left, which is one of the front pages of an issue of chemical abstracts, Janet Scott is there. This is 1939, and uh, she, uh, she was one of the associate editors at the time. Now, the associate editors, they reported in, I think, to Evan J. Crane, as it would have been at the time as he was the overall editor of uh, chemical abstracts. But under her, she would have had a number of associate editors who would have been the people who were 
uh, writing the abstracts that would go into, into chemical abstracts. And they did have remote workers, and it was quite, uh, quite interesting to see that even back in the 1930s, they had people working on these, um, on writing abstracts, uh, way from where um, Columbus, Ohio, where the chemical abstracts um, headquarters was based. Janet herself did work in the chemical abstracts headquarters. And I particularly like this little description here. Uh, this was in a, in a little booklet that I've got, uh, which is An Adventure in Knowledge, the story of the chemical abstract service. And I will just read that out, is that the abstractors are a remarkably diverse group. A Jesuit priest who specializes in quantum mechanics, an Indonesian woman in Germany skilled in agricultural bio biochemistry, a Roman chemist who comprehends eight languages, including Azerbaijani, an ink maker who pens his summer reviews while fishing off an island in Iowa, a resident of the Pennsylvania Dutch country whose interests range from explosive to honeybees, an author of a modern Russian English technical dictionary with a scholarly interest in ancient Hittite civilization. What that all sounded very nice to me until I read this bit about the Pennsylvania Dutch people with an interest in explosives and honeybees. And I used to, when I was living in America and near Philadelphia, very close to the Pennsylvania Dutch country, um, I can completely imagine them liking honeybees because they seem a very peace loving and gentle people. And the concept of a Pennsylvania Dutch person actually having an interest in explosives seemed highly unlikely to me. But we have to believe it, I suppose, because it was in this little book, um, An Adventure in Knowledge. So what were the Brits doing all this time while uh, things were going on in Europe and they were going on in America? Um, it, uh, meanwhile, the Brits were very busy themselves. They were working on British chemical abstracts, of course. Uh, it's a little bit late to the game. It could be considered a relatively minor publication by comparison with the longer lived chemical abstracts, but it was a very good pedigree and it had its origins in the Journal of the Chemical Society and was highly regarded for a number of years. As already mentioned before, I've mentioned a few times now that the Chemical Society published abstracts in its journal since the 1840s. So it's not surprising they decided to sort of spin this off and have a separate, um, a separate uh, uh, abstracts journal. Um, for fun, I tried the AI systems again, Bing, ChatGPT and Google Bard to see what they could tell me about British chemical abstracts. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, they failed miserably on this one. And so I haven't uh, included any of the output from that uh, search because it would have been very misleading. So the uh, the AI systems, it was, a, it was a bit of a difficult one for them, really. It would be difficult for most people and most uh, sources of information to come up with a lot of information about British chemical abstracts. This is an abstract from British chemical abstracts, just to show the density of information that was compressed into such a small space. And this would also, not dissimilar to what a chemical abstracts abstract looked like, but um, um, they, they, they were different. There were differences quite often for the same paper, the same abstract, uh, the abstracts of the same paper were somewhat different sometimes between the two publications, but this is just one single example of a British chemical abstracts paper. And um, it had a little bit of a checkered, checkered history, I suppose. It uh, never really was financial, financially viable uh, British chemical abstracts. And because uh, it, there was so much competition, I think, with, others, with other sources of information, they tried to diversify and incorporate other, other, um, other subjects like your other society. So it wasn't just a chemical society publication by the time we got to, um, to the later years. Uh, and it changed its name to British Abstracts because the diversity of the content was changing um, uh, 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 um, due to due to trying to trying to accommodate more and more uh, branches of chemistry and related subjects. Um, I think uh, the, the it ceased to be published in 1953, probably because it was a little bit confusing. The name changes were infusing, uh, were confusing, and the marketplace simply wasn't big enough for several abstract journals in chemistry. And I think the war, the, they suffered a lot in the wartime, from what I can gather, uh, but never really properly recovered, um, and, and then ceased in 1953. I wrote a slide in 2008 that uh, formed part of a presentation I gave to the uh, at an American Chemical Society meeting, if I remember correctly, I'm sure it was in fact, 
And uh, at the time, 2008 or thereabouts, I'd said that it was highly unlikely that British chemical abstracts would ever be digitized because it was so out of date. It was held in very few libraries by that time as well, uh, mainly in society libraries. I don't know whether they even still um, hold it now. Um, and it was mainly of historical interest back in 2008. But again, if you go to Internet Archive, um, one of my favorite tools, as I mentioned before, and search for uh, uh, British chemical abstracts, it's surprising what you find. You find quite a lot of them. Even going, having gone through the name change to British chemical and physiological abstracts, which was uh, the name, one of the one of the name changes that the publication had. So I was quite impressed by that. They're not in completely in the right order. And when I tried searching for British abstracts, that failed miserably. It found all sorts of things. Uh, the word British and the word abstracts must uh, be very common metadata terms, I think, in, in, in the Internet Archive. So that didn't work very well. But one thing I found quite fascinating here was that it was bookended by a couple of things I wouldn't have expected to see um, in, the, in the listing, because this, this is the entire listing of what I found, actually, for British chemical abstracts. And we start off with notes on the paranormal, which doesn't, I couldn't think how on earth that one got retrieved. And then at the end, notes on, uh, sorry, the last one was called Ibogaine or Ibogaine, I don't know how you pronounce it, literature. And that was the actual title of the publication. And this dates back to 19, 1997, I think that one was published. So it wasn't even in the same time period as British Chemical Abstracts. Now, I did Google Ibogaine literature, and it was something to do with a drug to treat drug um, addiction, I think, if I remember rightly. But um, it, uh, it is, a, it is a, a, an intriguing one that I've never got to the bottom of. Another favourite publication of mine when I was a chemistry librarian was the Merck Index, single volume work that uh, had the, the answers to so many questions when people used to come into the library. And I did discover that you you could still buy it from Amazon, a printed version of it. If you go into Amazon, um, the British Amazon, I think I went to amazon.co.uk, you probably find that you can get the, uh, the 2013 uh, edition. And when I checked, it was about 68 pounds, which didn't seem too bad for the amount of information that you would have in it. And if you if you only wanted to spend six pounds, 5.99, you could get a copy of the 13th edition. But it did stop publishing. The 15th was the last print edition and the RSC took over the publication in 2013 and updates it regularly as part of the Merck database, which currently contains over 12,000 records. So one of my favourite sources that one was. Um, this is what the inside looked like. Uh, more of the uh, condensed information, a bit more voluminous perhaps than you'd expect in the, than we saw in the British Chemical Abstracts abstract. But this is again, uh, it, it's including lots of information from lots of different sources, including patents, and it's really a very, very good, was a very good source of information. Um, I'm now going to have a little dabble very quickly into the, uh, the computer era, uh, and I'm not going to go into the detail of this at all, really, due to lack of time, but um, the transition to the computer era, the digital era, ha era, however we want to refer to it, kind of started, this is back in the 1950s, when these cards were used as um, a manual information retrieval system, but they were a way, they, these, these systems were particularly uh, prevalent in industry because uh, the, the, the people working in industry would gather together references that were particularly useful to their field. And then they would record the information about the references on these cards. And then there would have been a system like the one on the right hand side there, uh, which you could use to pick out uh, references for particular keywords. So the little the holes punched would represent index terms that would enable a sort of a manual way, a sort of semi-automatic manual way to select the articles that might be of interest to you. Chemistry databases, what made them happen? Well, you can kind of guess it's just uh, uh, technology had moved on to such an extent that we could start to do uh, ex much better telecommunications networks and research was going on. The information explosion continuing. Um, commercial impetus from the pharmaceutical and chemical industries was a big driver, I think, as well. And then also the development of um, mechanisms by which you could represent two and three dimensional structures uh, in, uh, in, in, um, 
well, in, in, in a, in a two-dimensional form, rather than using chemical nomenclature, alternative ways of representing, um, uh, representing chemical structures in, in lin using linear notations and also, um, also uh, uh, fragmentation codes, which is what is pictured on the right side there. A few landmarks here. Uh, hopefully, I'm not upsetting too many people. These are a little bit subjective, but and it stops in two thousand in the year two thousand. But these were some of the uh, big landmarks, I think, in chemistry database history. The Cambridge Crystal Structure Database, which I'm going to mention uh, in a few moments, a little bit more, uh, was one that um, is a real pioneer in this area. And the Derwent World Patent Index, well, I used to work for Derwent Publications for a little while. And uh, so that one is, is, again, dear to my heart. But some of these other more recent ones you'll see later on, Barstein and SciFinder, were pretty revolutionary in their coverage and the way they enabled people to find information so much more easily. I said that I worked at Derwent Publications, and, and, uh, and I did. Uh, this uh, is the pic, and you might be thinking, well, why is there a picture here of a building? Well, that's actually the building I used to work in, in Berkshire House in uh, High Holborn in London. And I used to work for the, uh, the, the literature division rather than the patents division. But really, Derwent was very famous and still is very famous for its uh, patent uh, uh, being a source of patent information, a data magnet, uh, um, um, a huge database of of patents, all indexed and and accessible online, of course. But it owes both Derwent Literature Division, where I was, and the and the Derwent Patent Information, were um, very much uh, the brainchild of Monty Hyams because he founded Derwent Publications. He had a very long life from 1918 to 2013, and I did meet him a few times. I think he gave me my, I think I just, I only stayed at Derwent for about a year and a half. And I think I had one performance review where I actually met uh, Monty, but um, I don't remember very much about it um, at the time. But uh, anyway, he was my sort of boss's 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 boss at the time when I was working at Derwent. But um, Monty founded Derwent. Um, he was a life president after he had finished working there when he retired in 1984. And he's won all kinds of prizes for his work on um, patent information. And there's a lot more that I could talk about um, with how all, all of that work was done. And these are some coding sheets that we used to use in the literature division. So we'd sit and look at people working in the patents division. They would have had patents to look at and I was looking at uh, journal articles and papers, and for every time a compound got mentioned in a paper, or, or that it would be analyzed by the people like myself who were indexing uh, the compounds. And so if we had a carbon-carbon um, a triple bond present, for example, over here on the right-hand side, uh, then a cross would have been put in, in a box with just, just a pen mark um, in the box, and then uh, once all these had been coded and checked by our bosses, then uh, they would have gone on to the hole punchers and then they would have gone into a, ca a card system that would then have in in, um, enabled retrieval by computers at that point. One thing that uh, Derwent was uh, very good at was Marcouche structures, because you had these, because in uh, it, it was vague in some ways in the way that you could, you, you, you could um, input all of these different structural features, but um, you weren't always sure of what the relationship between those features might have been when you were coding on those chemical coding sheets that I showed just now. So they were they were very good, therefore, at coding um, Marcouche structures. And there's a few examples of those on the right hand side. And Marcouche structures were, are, are um, very, very common in patents, particularly much more common than they are, I think, in um, in, uh, in journal and journal articles and other primary publications. Um, a couple more heroes, and then I really will have to stop because I'm running really running short of time, aren't I now? But um, somebody I came across very recently uh, was Barbara Metz Stark, and uh, she uh, is a real pioneer. Actually, I was so impressed by all the things that she achieved at a very difficult time because she was um, studying chemistry in Freiburg University in Germany, uh, but she was excluded in 1942 because she was half Jewish. And therefore, she was expelled. Uh, they were half Jewish students and workers and workers um, were expelled from German universities. So she got a job in a metal working plant um, performing chemical analyses. And after the war, she went back to Freiburg, got her PhD and her doctorate in 1959. 
But her real claim to fame, perhaps, is that she was the originator of two things, the Stark bibliography, and she gathered together a phenomenal amount of, amount of information about micro, microwave spectroscopic data and uh, included all of this in, um, in what would originally have been a printed uh, reference, the Stark bibliography. And then she uh, added data for gas phase molecules um, derived from by various different techniques. Um, so computational techniques were coming along even in that time. And so she was able to extract information uh, by all, all, all kinds of different sources to create um, what ended up being, um, I think it all got fed into this Mogadoc um, database, the Molecular Gas Phase Documentation Database in the early 1980s. Now, um, Barbara never actually sought uh, fame and recognition. She had a difficult life. She had a stroke, I think, when she was uh, in 1983, and she carried on working as a volunteer, really, um, really uh, continuing to develop um, her database and and other other aspects of her work as well. And she she also um, ended up founding the uh, Barbara Metz-Stark Foundation Building, uh, which is at the University of Ulm, where she ended up uh, working. I don't know whether the Mogadoc database still exists. Oops, sorry, jumping ahead a bit too fast there. The Mogadoc, um, I couldn't find, I found information to suggest that it was still around in about 2014, 2015, but whether it's uh, still around now, perhaps somebody knows, perhaps somebody's come across it. But there is a book bottom right here that uh, is, is about Barbara Metzstark and it's available from Amazon in German and in English, I believe. And uh, and it's a second-hand book, which I'm tempted to buy if nobody beats me to it. And my final heroine is uh, Olga Kennard, who uh, sadly passed away earlier this year. And she established the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Centre in, uh, in Cambridge, uh, of course. And she was involved with the founding of a number of other uh, of databases, as, of databases, so the Protein Data Bank, Nucleic Acid Sequence Database, and so on. And she was she's, she unlike Barbara Met Stark, uh, she didn't she did receive plenty of awards in recognition of of her work. Now she was another emigrant from Germany, and she married um, a British a British guy. She started off as as Olga Weiss, and she married uh, and changed her name to um, Kennard, and uh, she was the director of the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Centre until her retirement in 1997. There are lots of uh, there are, well, I say lots of, there are some uh, obituaries around on the internet and that um, QR code bottom right just takes you to one of them. Um, I think it was the European Crystallographic um, Society that, uh, that uh, or organization that published a particular uh, uh, obituary. So Olga is definitely a, a real heroine. I do have some, they're a little bit tenuous, my memories of Olga Kennard, but one of my jobs was editing at Crystallographica and I do remember one thing, the frequency with which Olga's name cropped up, either, either as an author or in the citations that I was going through editing Actor Christ. And I also remember it, um, when I was teaching chemi uh, chemical information at UMIST, um, I was always exceptionally grateful for the Cambridge Structural Database because it was the only free at the point of use database that was available in my early days at UMIST. And I don't know whether Brian Beagley is on the call today. I think he does come to some of these um, these uh, these uh, uh, talks. But um, Brian and I worked uh, closely on um, delivering teaching activities for the students at uh, UMIS, the chemistry students. Uh, there will be a symposium celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Olga Kennard at the ACS Spring Meeting in New Orleans in March next year. So on that note, um, having run out of time. Uh, I just wanted to show um, a, a Chemical Abstracts online mug. Maybe after all of that talk, we're ready for a cup of coffee or tea, but will it be from a Chemical Abstracts online mug? I don't know, but this uh, dates back to, I think, 1990. And sadly, my mug um, is broken a long time ago. It didn't, um, it didn't survive um, its rough treatment when I was at UMIST, unfortunately. So, um, Peter, everyone, I've, I've, uh, that, that's, that's where I'm going to stop and just be very pleased to receive any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Helen. We have a few questions and in fact, we have a lot of comments. I'll ask the questions first and then I'll go through the comments fairly quickly as um, we are a little bit short of time and people are dropping off. 
Now, the first and most important one, in a way, is that being asked, could you put the QR that you did early on, could you make it visible again? Because I think it passed by very quickly. I didn't hear it myself. And so we, I've been asked if you could sort of... Which, which one, Peter? Off. Can you remember? There are a lot of QRs. Can you one remember? One which... very, very early on. Right, I'll have a go. Um, let me see. I must admit that these QRs are, can, can be a bit problematic sometimes. <laughs> And a woman was jammed in a car park. Was it, was it that one? Yes, possibly, yes, that one, okay. Mm -hmm. so that, uh, Isabel, I hope that's the one you wanted. Uh, we'll, hold it, we'll hold it on screen there so people can find it. Now, uh, what else? What other questions do we have? I just didn't from... Um, here, we have Michael Dewar asked the question and uh, made the comment. His question is peer review. What is the status of the communicating FRS and RS publication? Does it reduce the extent of peer review? In other words, sorry, can you see it? Sorry, I, I didn't catch the question. I'll read, I'll read it out again. Uh, peer review. What is the status of the communicating follow of the Royal Society and Royal Society publication? Does it reduce the extent of peer review? I'm, I'm sorry, I still didn't really catch it. Should I try the chat? Um... You, you, you go to chat. If I might do it quite close to the beginning. I don't know why you can't hear me. I'm not on mute or anything. No, it just, it just didn't come through. I, I wasn't quite clear clear what the question was on that one. Um, but a bit complicated. It basically, whoever followed... Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. I can. Yes, yes. Uh, if whoever having followed, submitting papers to philosophical transactions, Reduces the need for peer review, or, or precluded, precluded peer review. There would have been no, in, in the early days of philosophical transaction, there wouldn't have been any peer review. Um, no, that's my it, that, was, that was my feeling. That was my yeah, feeling. Um, so there was a date, wasn't there, that I mentioned, I think it was the late 19th century before peer review really kicked in. So... No, I think it would have been pretty subjective. It would have been up to Henry Oldenburg at the very beginning of time. Place. It was in place of peer review, in a sense. Now, Jerry, now, okay, questions. Let me sort of, um, we've got lots of comments, which I'm going to read out. But um, let's, uh, okay. Now, my question for me, can anyone access Merck Index online? I didn't realise it was online these days. I still have the Centennial edition myself. Um, yes, you can, but I th think you probably have to pay for it. Uh, if there's someone from uh, the RSE, that they, probably in, in academic institutions, if you're working in academia, then okay, very, okay. very likely that they were, you would, your organisation would have a subscription to it. But right. as an individual, I'm not quite sure of the status, but I don't think you can access it. I think I tried it and I couldn't. Do you know if it's still got the youthful chemical reaction section, but the later printed one had? I don't, I can't, uh, I don't know. I'm not familiar enough with the, the latest edition. Oh, the very useful feature of the very, very final printed one. It had a nice section at the back about name reactions, and it was a very good arrangement of the name reaction. Okay, now just come comment, which I'll read through quickly, because I appreciate it with all the time. Jerry Moss said, chemical reviews, chemical society abstract started in the mid-19th century, but you dealt with that. Uh, Michael Dewar said, chemical use is still a good read. In fact, I can give a plug here because I gave the RSC library my set of chemical use, a very complete set of chemical use, and they hope to digitise it sometime. So hopefully it'll become available in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Diana, Diana Leach, I assume. Helen, I know you said some, but you didn't mention the International Catalogue of Scientific Literature which is a fairly rare publication in most libraries today. It did have a chemical section and predated chemical abstract. I thought I read that was the one I'd actually showed. Um, yeah, but I must say, some of these questions came before you actually... Thought. Yes, probably so, yes, yes. Um, now, what's the other one? Um, Diana also says, we had it, I assume she means the International Catalogue of Scientific Literature, in Manchester, I also recently discovered when preparing a new talk about Bruno Mond, the 150th anniversary, 
Pelu Bugmon would involve with the international catalogue. Now, lots of people say, somebody says here, Jerry Moss, uh, the rubber handbook is also a useful source of information. Oh, yes. It, it, yeah, I used to use that a lot as well. Yes. Um, and I've got one comment myself, and that is that you talk about your surprise that the Pennsylvania Dutch would be interested in explosives, and I don't want to misunderstand what you were saying, but I think one has to distinguish between the Pennsylvania Dutch as a whole and the Amish. Ah. The Pennsylvania Dutch covers a much bigger group than just the Amish. For example, did you ever know Ned Handel? Sorry, for example? Did you ever know Ned Handel at Lehigh University? No. No, he was a president of the ACS. He was also a great friend of the scientific um, chemical heritage. He was also a great friend of chemical heritage. He was Pennsylvania Dutch, but he wasn't Amish. To give an example. Right, yes, yes, yes. I apologise for not getting no, that no, differentiation. No, no, no problem, but just a, just a bird of board of category. Okay, well, everybody's saying what a wonderful talk that was, and I will conclude myself by saying what an excellent talk it was. So thank you again, Helen, for giving us your insights into the history of chemical information. It's a useful link between us and TICAC, I think. So thank you for giving these talks. So thank you very much everybody for attending, particularly our visitors, if I may call them that, from SIGAC and from uh, RSC Publications. And I hope you all have a good afternoon and goodbye for now. We'll see you next month when we're having a, 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 a um, Christmas lecture on a chemical Christmas cow. Uh, so that'll be a very interesting talk indeed by Dan Cornwall Grove from K KCL. So please join me again next month on the 19th of December just a week before Christmas for our chemical Christmas lecture. So for now, everyone, goodbye and hope to see you again sometime. Bye for now. Bye.